morning, uh, everyone. I, I heard that Kochi is uh, a very energetic crowd. So good morning. Good morning. Thank you. So it's very interesting what uh, Mahesh had walked us through. So first of all, congratulations on what you're building. I just wish it was 1960s and we had this rock star among us. And I think it's very super important to understand the evolution and let us understand that okay, Mahesh uh, just created his OS in the 1960s and everybody is going wild that now we are able to basically digitize our workflows and optimize uh, our day to day transactions. So I will not go into the details of OS creation, but we will probably zoom past the era where internet has been launched and everybody is going bongos in terms of establishing um, online presence. So for example, um, what happens when the internet is established and everybody sees the potential? Like if anybody of you is running a business, the main criteria would be how do I reach out to maximum potential customers through my digital presence? Right? Or if I'm running a company, my next target would be on how do I optimize my operations or departments and make them more productive. This actually led to a huge enormous investments in client server computing. Now we see past that and now we see that many enterprises are embracing web development, ERPs. I'm talking about ERPs as small applications which leads to a combination of applications coming together to form huge monolith ERPs. And I think uh, most of you already know that large companies uh, started embracing large e-commerce applications as well. So parallel, we also have open source uh, developments uh, that are happening. Uh, these are just to compete against the large uh, monopolist regimes. Uh, but also the intent is to make uh, very big projects accessible to mass audience. In my opinion, I think the major uh, breakthrough was in cloud computing. Uh, basically, uh, if you wanted to establish yourself as a software vendor, you had to do a lot of investment right, in terms of infrastructure. You had to buy your computers, assemble them, network cards, data, electricity, real estate, infrastructure, and it was a very big investment. And only very few people who had deep pockets were able to establish uh, services in that space. But with the advent of cloud computing, everything was so easy to set up. And I always had evolution with abstraction. And I think this abstraction of the hardware complexities that led to cloud computing was more successful. In the early 2000s, uh, we had a lot of collaboration and version management, um, CBS, SPN, they had their own limitation as they came to JIT. Um, and uh, JIT Hub, uh, around 2008, tried to bring collaboration with a different uh, twist and uh, source coach, which was the, the prime facing for open source, took the backseat. Jitsum's popularity was collaborate, but version management through a common hub called Jitsum. As the technology evolved, we had a lot of other enhancements that we could um, start building our own library, share them, they were packaged by the more NPMs. We had talkers, we had low code, low code solutions, and then today we are in the and of generative AI. So I think the evolution is uh, necessary in terms of progression, uh, but uh, everybody has to understand that progression over perfection, that is the theme of today. But let us now pause and look back exactly like are we in the right direction. Just to give you a synonym, it is as good as after our 10th, we do our 12th, we go through an engineering degree only to look back and understand did we really want to be engineers, right? We just followed the trend and then we realized that hey, maybe no, I should have done something different. Alright, 
So let me just try to understand uh, that there are like roughly 60, 70 people here. How many of you are developers? Please raise your hand. How many of you are business owners? And if I just uh, tell you some terms, just quickly raise your hand. How many of you are plugin developers? Or WordPress plugin developers? Ah, just raise your hand. Uh, one. <laughs> then uh, how many of you are ISPs? Independent software <coughs> vendors. Uh, no, I'll explain that. It's not a certification. Uh, how many of you work in startups? No. Or work for startups? Like you might work in startups. Uh, you might have my company also work for startups. <coughs> so let us all understand what are the real challenges as developers. Most of them are developers. I think 95% plus all are developers. What are the challenges that you face today? So let's say you want to build something. Uh, what is the first thing that you do? You do Google and you try to find out if somebody has built that before. Like, do you, everybody agrees? Yes, raise your hands, please. Okay. So when you Google, what do you find? Okay, you find somebody has built this before, there is some open source repository, and you try to learn from that open source repository. But then your next intent is can I just grab that piece of code and probably use it in my own project. The problem that you will see is somebody previously has built GOS, for example, Mahesh has built this OS, but then the problem with that be that you only want pieces of modules that you know, Mahesh has built but not entire OS. So this is one of the major problems that we see that people find it very hard to extract information which are very specific to their needs because they end up finding huge silos of code base. In the event, they did find uh, small silos. They realized that the, those silos are so out of date versions that it becomes difficult for them to integrate with their existing application. It doesn't end there, right? So once you get the code base, now you have to start thinking about deep down on the architecture, right? So for example, if you give a solution to a startup versus you give a solution to a large enterprise. Uh, the differences in terms of scalability, performance, compliance, and so forth. So you spend a lot of time and in architecting those solutions. You also have uh, concerns on adopting third-party code, right? So what are those concerns? And like, is it reliable? You might probably you know, see a developer from, let's say, China or Russia, and then you don't have the stereotype, okay, then it's actually so you need some kind of a validation in terms of uh, no, what kind of third party no, codes you try to integrate. But in general, I think this lack of collaboration between teams that has led to what we are doing. So even though we are involved, uh, we still have these problems which I think as a community we need to resolve. So what is the solution? And I think this solution has to be driven everyone, all those backbenchers there, we need to solve this. So uh, let us understand how we can solve this. So if I were to ask, uh, and probably you raise your hands, can we all collaborate to quickly build applications? Yes or no? Yes? Okay. So to quickly collaborate, what are the necessary uh, ingredients that we need to quickly collaborate? So for example, for me to speak to you and for you to listen to me, we need to have a standard language called English because if I speak Russian, nobody would understand. I also don't know Russian, Russian language. So the first thing is we need to have a basic benchmark in terms of standardization. Okay, so standardization is basically set of rules that okay, when we start developing, we would probably adhere to these standards, this data model. And that will be the first phase to start our collaboration. So collaboration is just a mindset. That okay, there are roughly seven people here. And I don't need to re-engineer all of the things because out of the seven people here, everybody is building the same set, uh, 
create a standardized piece of code which I can start reusing in my own code base. So collaboration mindset is the most important thing. Now that we have integration, standardization built in, we think about collaboration. Now we need to create those pieces of code which can be reused. So collaboration doesn't mean that you write 10,000 lines of code and you just dump it to your community. It doesn't work that way. You have to write a code in a way where it is micro in nature, which can be easily pulled, discovered, and plugged in to your uh, community's need or community's code base. And once you have all of these code base together, you need to have some kind of a uh, orchestration composable uh, solution where you could just grab those pieces of code, combine them together, and then deploy it for your end use. So, if you are able to uh, relate to this problem and if you are able to understand why there, why there needs to be a solution to resolve this, you will understand why Ablox was born. So, Ablox basically is uh, an open SDK. And uh, I'll be going to give you much details in terms of how this can resolve innovation that happens next door. That is, innovation that happens in an organization outside your organization can be brought in CSP while also keeping your innovation accessible to the outside world. So, Apple has multiple uh, to make to create an ad hoc kind of uh, infrastructure. We need uh, three or four key and start to go through them one by one. First, let us understand what AppLox is. AppLox is basically a combination of two terms, App and Box. What is an App? Today, App is basically anything that sits on top of your VM or your Docker. Okay? And if I go deeper, an App is nothing but a combination of a front end or a back end. So, when you say front end, you have uh, UI components. Uh, this can be your React or Angular or you, any printer kind of thing. You combine your UI components to create pages. And similarly on the back end, you combine your server side APIs to create your microservices or you create your PaaS. PaaS as in servers. Are you guys able to follow till here? Yes. So uh, once you start developing the code, the next thing is uh, in terms of what are those characteristics, right? So some of them, some of you would be like, okay, I need to create a micro front end. Some of you would be like, I need to create a microservice. So all of these characteristics are evolved today, and this is what you want your end code base to deliver, right? So, so for example, you need cloud native SaaS support. What does that mean? So it means that okay, once you deploy, it can go and plug into the cloud and scale and perform efficiently without even your knowledge. So that's the kind of abstraction that you need on how your code, two, three lines of code, is able to efficiently scale to millions of users. So abstraction completely uh, takes away those complexities from you. So there are a lot of other characteristics like uh, if you have, has anybody heard of the Mac, MACH, Mac Alliance? Okay, so these are some of the keywords that we'll start hearing as we evolve more in the next five years. So Mac is nothing but micro microservice API first, cloud native, and headless. And uh, for building a composable enterprise or composable applications, uh, these are some of the characteristics that you have to build, uh, and that will be enterprises future proof, and that will also make your services much more attractive. To customers. So when you build these characteristics, what Ablox promises is you will be enterprise ready by design. When I say enterprise ready by design, it basically means uh, you are scalable, you are uh, you are scalable, you are secure, you are performant, uh, and you know we have to maintain those compliances. The second ingredient is uh, the standard data model. So what standard data model means? For example, um, if you want to do an authentication system, uh, many of you will design your own tables, many of you will write your own authentication logic from ground up. Some of you might use Auth0, some of you might use Google Logins, and so forth. Right? So, 
uh, it is time to standardize everything because now we know that pretty much after almost 50 years of evolution, we know what are the best constructs of this data model so that now we can start speaking in the same language or the same model. So standard data model is a community driven uh, exercise where we come together and brainstorm on what are the data models that are required to kind of establish a standard evolution. Then we have uh, BBCLI. So what BBCLI means, uh, this is where the entire magic happens. So today when we write a code, uh, we write a code keeping performance in mind. So we say performance by design, security by design. But what BBCLI would do is it will try to enforce uh, reusability and collaboration by design. That is, when you start creating a code, the first thing that comes to mind is, hey, I'm going to write this or develop this code uh, with the intent of sharing this to my peers. Okay? So, and the BBCLI has a very smart logic uh, which will identify that, okay, if you are trying to share this and create a micro repository out of it, which you can publish and uh, share it to your, your community. Um, yeah, so now understand that what are we, uh, what are we trying to build here? So once you start writing those small, small blocks, uh, what does it lead to? Right? So let's say if you write a block and you combine them with a block from your peer, uh, we call it a package block. That is, a combination of blocks is called a package block. Uh, but if you further combine these blocks together and if it has a business meaning to it, then we call it PBC, that is packaged business. Capabilities. Packaging business capabilities is a business term which basically means anything that gives business value. Uh, for example, like mobile checkout uh, is a business uh, is a business uh, function. So once you combine your technical components, it becomes a PBC. A combination of PBC basically the app. A combination of app is basically an ERP, or it could be like a super app, like how Tata New is a super app. And uh, you can also go the distance of creating your own web and pop quiz. So here, uh, let me just uh, divert that attention to PBC. PBC is more business related. Uh, so only one person has a business, right? Right here. Business, you are running business. Two people. Uh, yeah, so for, this is more business related, so I'll just give an example. Um, so during COVID times, right? Uh, COVID times, what triggered was many companies had to move away from work from office to work from home culture. And uh, what happened was uh, there was a shift from attendance tracking, right? So attendance tracking from coming to office and swiping to moving them to your online way of capturing attendance. So from a business standpoint, your challenge should be how do I process my payroll because now I don't get my attendance data from the in-office swipe machines, right? So composable enterprise is, is, is a mindset where you have to plan your enterprise in a way that everything is composable by design. That is, today if I Today, if I think that my enterprise is super efficient, uh, it doesn't really matter because when something like COVID came in, your 100% efficient organization failed to be flexible in terms of capturing attendance data and ultimately process the payment. So enterprise, uh, composable enterprise is the next big thing. And what drives the enterprise composable is through PPC implementation. What this means is, I should be in a position to rotate out the attendance management system from in office swipes to some kind of an online based modular capability. And PPCs uh, have those characteristics that is, they have to be modular, they have to be autonomous, they have to be operating on its own, and they can be orchestrated with the rest of the requirements. So, where do you find those reusable components and those reusable? So if you come to the app docs, um, you will actually see a store where you can quickly 
start finding those uh, components or package blocks or normal blocks that the community has created. And you can just uh, quickly use the BB CLI and download them to your own project and uh, start accelerating your development by embracing innovation from I don't know if everybody has followed me here, uh, but if you carefully look at the screen, this is what AppBlock is trying to solve. So today, uh, when you have a huge ERP, so let me just name a few, few ERPs. Or can somebody name some ERPs? ERP Next. ERP Next. Yeah, SAP, ERP. Yeah, SAP, ERP Next, Auto, these are all the ERPs today. So what happens in the ERP ecosystem is there is a core foundation which enterprise or business uses and uh, then to extend that functionality uh, independent software vendors, ISPs, they come in and attach to these ERP main core ERP vendors and give additional functions to it. So this ecosystem uh, is thriving today, that is ERP and this ISV ecosystem. Another uh, variation to this is, uh, I think everybody has understood uh, knowledge of WordPress. WordPress CMS. So WordPress CMS also is built on the same core function, that is you have a CMS at the center, and then you have the plugin ecosystem, there are like 30,000 plugins, which attaches to WordPress and gives you the extended features. So you can have an e-commerce from WordPress, and also CMS functionality in, let's say, auto, which you can very easily switch and use. What I was just trying to shift is if you are a startup and if you are building your own startup product, your main problem is how do you connect this with the rest of the world. So today, the only way that is possible is you have to have some kind of a iPaaS kind of an integration. iPaaS basically means uh, somebody which can connect to outside ERP systems through some system integration. Uh, so for example, Zapier is one of them. So the reason why we do this is because our evolution has been, has been in that in that in that manner. So Aplox is trying to change that. Aplox says that if you have a standard data model and if there are three startups here and one of them is building CMS, one of them is building HRM, and one of them is building payroll. Then if you have built a payroll and give it to your customer, you can always tell your customer that even though this is my core offering, I can also bring you a suite of applications because many of the HRM CR companies are using the same standardization data model and they are all integrated by design. So, so the conclusion. So what are we trying to uh, what are we trying to bring here to Coche? First of all, yeah, so we are part of the evolution and we see that okay, there is a great value add in terms of building uh, in terms of building the next collaboration uh, through reusability. And uh, I would definitely advocate people to try this out. The blocks that you are writing here is open source by nature. We plan to keep it MIT for now. And uh, this will allow you to pull those blocks of code which are written by uh, your peers and you can use it and distribute it to your customers as well. So thank you for listening. Uh, I know you have a lot of questions, so feel free to ask any questions.
cloud native SaaS where you give it to a customer and you promise them it uses all the features of cloud in terms of performance and scaling. So it becomes a cloud native SaaS. Because SaaS existed in the 1990s as well. Okay. Now, we are giving you the blocks of code that you have written to create a program. Basically, you are developing the block and you are sharing it with others. Okay. And what we are developing is being shared with you. So for you to create a restaurant management system or a hotel management system, you can cherry pick all those modules which are reusable in nature and quickly build your SaaS. Yeah, uh, so today you have the option of going to NPM and downloading libraries, right? Ah, so, and you already using GitHub. So, Applox is using NPM, it is also using GitHub. But there is a standardization version in the which allows you to quickly download these blocks with the least headache. That is, today if you download anything from NPM, your main problems are whether the versions are to your matching project's version or not. Right? So you always have that problem. So let's say if you download one version from NPM and then you try to download and you just keep your project one year on the side, then you come back again and you download something you have a lot of conflicts. Right? Because there is no standardized mechanism in place. Apple is trying to resolve and that's why I said evolution. GitHub tried to solve collaboration. GitHub didn't try to solve the version problem. Okay. NPM tried to solve the distribution problem, but NPM did not try to solve the standardization problem. Huh? Apple is basically the layer on top of all of these beautiful technologies and try to solve the integration problem. Okay, great question. Anything you have a follow up question? Yeah, so uh, it, it is the same mechanism how NPM works today, right? Yeah, it is the same mechanism. That is, uh, when you create a library and you push it out to the app box and let's say, we know that uh, there are some problems and you are not maintaining it, right? Then we have the same set of problems in terms of alerting the end users that, okay, when as the world progresses to later versions of the entire package, this one is not being made yet, and then we will find mechanisms to update it or suggest alternatives. Guys, we are actually out of time right now, so can we take this conversation yeah. into yeah. the break? So, can, right. we, can we take maybe one more question? Anybody who has any additional questions? Any other questions? How about code ownership? Like, how does that act? Yeah, so code ownership, uh, the, there are two variations, right? One, uh, there is a owner and then there is a contributor. So, for example, uh, whenever you build those blocks, okay, uh, you can, you are using these blocks not only for your own company, but you want to give it to your customers as well. So in that case, uh, as uh, owners, you have the option to either invite people to have a contributor license agreement, which is the format that you are planning to do now, and then, um, even though everything is MIT licensed, the ownership doesn't make a difference, right? Because MIT will give you distribution, uh, distribution, uh, and also in terms of uh, maintenance and edits, all of those uh, constraints are removed with MIT license. So, uh, if you want to contribute to blog, there are two ways. You can either be the owner of that code, or you can probably find an owner who's ready to accept your code by signing a scale. 
All right. Uh, so thank you for listening. If you have any further questions, uh, if you want to learn more about Applox, be free to reach out to us. Uh, the email address is info at applox.com. Thank you for basically listening. I'll be around, so you can catch us soon. Thank you. Bye.